Before I get into my thoughts on part two of Secrets of Prince Andrew, the documentary from A&E, I want to show you this clip. You threw a, a birthday party um, for Epstein's girlfriend, Galen Maxwell, at Sandringham. No, it was a shooting weekend. A shooting weekend. Just a straightforward, straightforward shooting weekend. Oh my God. A shooting weekend is very different to a birthday. You see, they're trying to put things in his mouth, which is completely incorrect, and he's correcting her. I mean, he's more concerned with protocol and whether or not it was a shooting weekend or a dinner party than he is about the nature of the crime. Why didn't they do that in the first part when they were letting friends of Prince Andrew spout off conspiracy theories about digital alterations of photographs of him with Virginia? Why did they not intersplice clips like they did there? Here's what's bothersome. Part two is good of this documentary. And it's good because it's not part one. It really feels like two entirely separate documentaries. And I don't know if I think they did a good enough job pulling the threads through from part one to part two. Because what's interesting about this documentary that you see in part one are the women of the BBC who were able to get this interview, to wait it out, to not take the red lines drawn in the sand by Prince Andrew's chief of staff and to wait it out until he was ready to speak. And the absolutely masterful job Emily Maithless does in this interview. The women who took down Prince Andrew could have been the name of the documentary. The interview that took down a prince could have been another name. The Royal Regret, colon, Prince Andrew's interview that changed it all. Or even nine days that unraveled Prince Andrew because things move very quickly from the pre-interview at Buckingham Palace with Prince Andrew and the BBC to, to Prince Andrew stepping down as a working royal, being stripped of his military titles, etc. I would have to look at any sort of ratings to understand how many people watched part one and then decided to skip part two, which is infuriating because part two is an entirely different documentary and it is good. We get to see how good, thoughtful, thorough journalism can and does happen. I'm not entirely sure that we actually learned any secrets. I think the documentary was too long and I think it wanted to be too many things. I think that in an attempt to be fair and balanced, there was a lot of overcorrecting. And I think they missed a real opportunity to bring in different voices earlier to create a wider picture of Prince Andrew. It feels too much like they were trying to show in the beginning, look, Prince Andrew did good things. He, you know, He's a person like anyone else. And I think they went too far and too long in that direction and never really bring back like how this all relates. They start this idea of a dual personality and then completely lose the thread. Honestly, the biggest shocker to me from part two of this documentary was the fact that Prince Andrew threw a curveball at Sam and Emily when they were coming for the pre-interview at Buckingham Palace. He brings his daughter Princess Beatrice. So she has to be there and they have to find a way to ask Prince Andrew these questions about sexual abuse and his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein with his daughter right there. And as there's been discussion recently about Prince William using Charlotte in that video when he got a lot of heat for not actually going to England's World Cup final in Australia, made me think of this situation where Prince Andrew might have been using the child as a shield. Granted, an adult child, but a child of Prince Andrew nonetheless. I'm not sure what discussions happened before Princess Beatrice agreed to go with Prince Andrew to this pre-interview. I have no idea. I'm sure the feelings that she has about this situation and her father are incredibly complicated. But what he says is specifically that he could not have been dancing with Virginia at a nightclub in London on March 10th because he went to Pizza Express from 4 to 5, somewhere within that range, p.m. with Princess Beatrice. And that raised a question in my head. I was like, did, did they have a conversation that this is what they were going to say and this was the story? And I am not saying that is true, but it's the first thing that came to my mind that not only does he say that he specifically went to Pizza Express with only Princess Beatrice when he says that night he was with both of his children, but Princess Beatrice is the one that comes to the pre-interview with the BBC too. And that might be Absolutely nothing, but I just found that interesting in light of that actually shocking piece of information that she was there for the pre-interview. 
What's really infuriating, though, is how long it takes the media to actually start covering Jeffrey Epstein and the Prince Andrew connection. It really does not become a story until other high-profile names are unearthed, like Prince Andrew. The documentary mentions this idea of sleeper stories, but it never actually goes into examining why a story that is well known to everyone else doesn't get reported. And I think understanding the mechanics of that would have been fascinating. And also this idea of, you know, who who are the editors and are they just taking their cues from what people on social media are talking about and want them to talk about? Recall, 2019 was also a very busy year for Harry and Meghan. We saw way more stories about that than Prince Andrew. But how much of it was wanting to protect the palace and because the palace was giving at the time a hard no, this did not happen. Prince Andrew refutes all allegations. That was a statement put out by Buckingham Palace, which was a really big deal because they usually do not respond. But they were definitely rank and file going to protect Prince Andrew. So I find the idea of a sleeper story interesting because it feels like it sort of takes responsibility off of the media that should be informing the public on what they need to know. Harry has a quote from his witness statement against, I believe, the Mirror Group, where he says that there's a difference between public interest and what interests the public. It's pretty clearly in public interest. Here's another clip that definitely should have been in part one. Some people have said Prince Andrew in some ways was being manipulated by Epstein and maybe, you know, wasn't as, as guilty as some of the other men. Prince Andrew wasn't as guilty. He's a grown man and he can make decisions. And if you are a good person, you're not going to just abuse young women. That was one of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein. In part one, it is floated that Prince Andrew was manipulated by Epstein. Why wasn't that clip right after the manipulation claim? Why didn't we have those back-to-back -back responses to give a broader picture? The storytelling in this documentary is off for me. I think this could have been a two-parter, three hours total, a little bit of backstory, but really focus on the women who made this interview possible, which really had a devastating impact. And honestly, I don't know if Prince Andrew would have stepped down from royal duties or would have gotten in so much trouble if it wasn't for this interview. You really see how the decision to do this interview and maybe not have the proper preparation, et cetera, led to his downfall. It's because of the interview that Virginia decides, I'm pissed, I am going to file a civil suit against him. It's the reasons charities decide days later that they want to cut ties with Prince Andrew. There is a story here that is not the focus and I am incredibly confused. Did it start off with a different documentary idea in mind? Something feels very off. And I want to end this video with a clip from Emily who interviewed Andrew. It's kind of a reminder that journalism at its most profound carries a huge weight of responsibility yes you know you you can change people's lives for better or for worse what a beautiful statement which again kills me because it could have been structured around this whole idea of good journalism and the impact of good serious hard-hitting journalism and it doesn't. It goes the salacious route to try to get viewers. And I get it, but I don't think it delivers on its promise. More videos to come. My overall recommendation is you do not need to spend four hours of your life on this documentary. Skip part one, go right to part two. You will be better for it.